Hi everybody and welcome to the first panel of day one of this um, fascinating conference on narratives. I'm Hussain Kassim, I'm a professor of um, politics at the University of East Anglia and an ESRC senior fellow under the UK and the Changing Europe project. Um, so it's a great pleasure to be with you. I've got um, a distinguished uh, number of panellists um, who are going to um, engage in conversation with me. Um, we're going to introduce um, a book project, that's myself and, and Adrian uh, Schout, who's a, a senior researcher at uh, Klingendal, um, about um, a book on the, on the topic of narratives, about, um, about European narratives. Um, we're going to say a few words to introduce this panel, a um, few substantive words that we've been invited to, to, um, to make, and then we're going to um, enter into a conversation with each of our um, panellists. There'll be time for Q&A thereafter, and finally, at the end, um, Adrian will um, will come in as our columnist, um, because unfortunately, um, our um, Andre Cruel won't actually be able to join us. He's stuck, I believe, in Athens. I don't find allowed to say that, but I've said that anyway. So he's unable to make it. Um, but um, Adrian will ven ventriloquise um, the um, the points that um, he would have um, he would have made. So I'm going to say a few words about um, this, uh, our forthcoming book, which we're just um, completing, um, something ab about Brexit, um, and then Adrian's going to um, present a few of the sort of over overall findings um, from the work that we've undertaken. So what's this book about? I mean, essentially, we, um, we've investigated national narratives about Europe um, as a way of trying to understand the different meaning that Europe has in different member states. Um, and what we understand by this is what um, what they all want from the member states, what they'll accept, what they won't accept from um, from the EU as a particular kind of form of, of European um, cooperation. We're interested in looking at the um, the career or the evolution of national narratives to the extent to which they're stable or change, what drives them, and the way in which they engage with counter narratives. In other words, forms of Euroscepticism or um, or, or challenges to the to membership or participation in the European Union or certain develops of the European Union. We've been interested in examining the extent to which um, they cohere with each other. Um, does the French narrative look anything like the German narrative or the Dutch narrative um, or the Italian narrative? And does that matter? Um, do any of those national narratives uh, match up to um, or repeat um, the tropes of the official EU narrative? Um, because you know, the EU, as we know, was founded on the basis of, of peace and prosperity. This is the foundational narrative. And what we're interested in is discovering the extent to which this particular theme is repeated by, um, by um, national political leaders. Um, we've looked at 11 member states. Um, we're delighted to have um, um, you know, four distinguished experts who are going to talk about their member states today. Um, and one former member state, that's the UK. And I've been invited to say a few words about about the UK in the sort of Brexit context. And I'm going to link this to um, to the narratives. Now, I think there's just three or four points I'd like to, I'd like to make here. The first is that the UK narrative has it was very different from other from other member states. Um, it was never it never committed itself to a return to the European home. Um, it never saw the EU as a guarantor of dem democracy or of economic modernisation. Um, it rarely invoked security or peace and prosperity. So one of the things that this teaches us about narratives is what um, they're as, as important for what they don't say as what they do say. And in the case of the UK, um, there are a lot of a lot of silences about topics that other about about, um, about principles and themes other that are central to other member states. It was different also in that there was no moment of um, formative narr narrative um, creation. There was no definitive um, moment of reckoning when the EU, when the UK decided to become a European uh, member state, an EU member state. Um, it, 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 there was no war defeat. There was no end of occupation. There was no regime change. Um, there was no um, sort of you know, a, you know key change of government um, that created. Um, a cross-party consensus, or even, in the case of the UA, U, UK, an intra-party um, consensus, because two, both of the two main parties were divided over the, over the, the, um, the um, issue of Europe, um, historically. Um, and because there was no single moment, this meant, no single, single moment of reckoning, this meant that Europe was part of the political game. There was no sort of extra, um, sort of political, competitive, 
point of reference everybody could agree on. Um, Europe was part of um, an adversarial politics in the UK, which means that um, it's a job of opposition to oppose, um, never to endorse, never to agree, even if you commit yourselves to the same values. That's very important. So that's my third. Um, that's my third um, point that um, the European narrative changed um, from um, government to government, and even within the space, uh, we, even in, in the span of um, a single government remaining you know, being in power for a particular term of office. The final point I want to make, and I think that this is this bears a sort of cautionary um, warning, is a point about the premiership of David Cameron. Because um, despite the fact that, that there had been um, Eurosceptic um, or assertive leaders before David Cameron, um, you may remember Margaret Thatcher, for example, um, no one had suggested that the UK might leave, uh, might cease to be a member state until Cameron's Bloomberg speech of 2013. And I think that was a very important moment because um, that, that, that you know, um, if you like, let the genie out of the bottle. It was very difficult thereafter to... Um, to um, insist on um, the UK, you know, um, uh, um, there was no way of, of, of reneging on a promise of an in-out um, referendum and this really meant that the possibility of leave um, was a serious one. The other um, issue that, um, that's really important about, about David Cameron is that he presented the EU's relationship with the UK as transactional. Um, the UK wasn't in the EU because it was a good thing, because it was necessary, because it uh, delivered um, um, you know, you know, security or non-economic benefits, it was um, purely because, um, on balance, it was better to be in the EU than not. And that, um, that I think, is important when we hear um, Eurosceptic messages being communicated by other governments. It might, um, it might warn them that um, ownership is a really important um, part um, of being a member state ownership of EU actions part of, being a, um, um, part of being a member state. Adrian, I know you've got um, the, the conclusions you want to summarise. Do you want to say something about, about um, what you've found as a result of these case studies? Well, thank you, uh, Hussein. Um, first of all, thank you also for participating here and sharing it. Uh, Hussein is not only a well-known scholar, but he's also the leading scholar, I would say, on the European Commission. And he was actually working with Barroso when Barroso was starting the whole debate about the narratives. Barroso wanted to have in 2013 a discussion in Europe on the narratives, precisely because what Minister Bone just said in the previous session, we need to change the, the DNA of our people. Uh, interestingly, or sadly, Barroso's uh, attempt to infuse the EU with a narrative failed. Maybe something we can come back to in our discussion later on. What could he have done? Uh, it's important that uh, I summarize a couple of points that our, our 11 member state case studies show about narratives. Uh, and there's a 12th actor that we also look at, and that is the European Commission. So where does the Commission stand with its narrative? Now, I want to make five points in the time that I have. One is narratives are important. Minister Bone already spoke about the need to change the DNA of people. Can you do that? But it's also for a practical perspective important that we, that we know each other's narratives. Uh, we have to, the EU is made of member states. We have to understand each other. Um, we could clearly see that uh, in, in June, July last year, when the uh, next gen EU budget was agreed, and all the countries that did not know that Germany would act as the hegemon, keeping the EU together, were banking on not helping Southern European countries. So if you want to have strike compromises, you have to understand each other's narratives. You have to be very intimately aware of the narratives and it's easy to misread the narratives of member states. That's an important point. Second point relates to if you want to change the DNA of the people, if you want to infuse people with narratives, can you actually change the, the narrative of people? What we see it, from the study of the narratives in the member states is that the narratives are overall looking at the long-term perspective fairly stable. Macron sounds in many ways like the goal, just as our prime minister in the Netherlands 
sounds like our prime ministers that we had in the 1950s and the 60s. Um, the, the goal, and we saw that also in the speech of uh, Minister Bowen this morning, um, the narrative was l'Europe uh, uh, fait la pouvoir. Uh, it's, it's Europe that creates power. That's not only because Europe needs power in the world, but also because France needs the power. Uh, so it was a sort of strength and weakness argument of France. And I think that is still there. We see with Greece and Italy that they have the fairly consistent narrative of we need to have a, a Europe based on solidarity. We are the good Europeans. We are the real federalists. That has never really changed. We want Europe for modernization, for solidarity. The only country that we see really change this narrative is Germany, and that we will look at. Uh, Germany needed Europe to regain its strength, but where is it now with its narrative? That's the country which is more difficult to, 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 to sketch. Uh, so, convergence? No, we don't see convergence. We'd rather see divergence because the narratives, they remain stable, but every new crisis fills the narrative as they already was. So the positions of the member states become more clearer. Uh, but also more divisive in a way. And we also see new blocks emerging around groups of narratives. Uh, the V4, the, 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 the frugal countries, uh, maybe some attempts to see the southern group emerging. So we see a tendency of divergence in the narratives. That's a statement for discussion. Now, which groups do we see? Importantly, why do we see the groups? So there's the northern group. Those are strong countries. They don't need Europe so much. The Danes are happy Danes. The Danes are proud of their administrations. They're proud of their e economy. They look at the world and they've got the Nordics. Eh? So the, the, the stronger member states don't rely so much. They don't expect so much from Europe. Eh? The UK even felt so strong that it left. Um, uh, the Southern member states really need Europe uh, and therefore they're rather demanding. Uh, East, the EU uh, needs the security dimension very much. Uh, so the extent to which country groups of countries demand something from the EU has to, de to do with their weaknesses, so to say. That also allows the question, now where does the European Commission come in? Well, actually, the European Commission's narrative resembles probably more or most the southern member states. Uh, whose commission is this? Uh, where does its narrative fit? Um, the, the fourth point is very brief about nexits, exits, Brexits. Do we see in the narrative study something about people wanting to leave? No, actually we see an enormous commitment also in countries like Poland and, and Hungary to be part of Europe. Right? Uh, uh, it's a love-hate relation that uh, Orman uh, presented. Uh, it's love as well. Uh, but there's also hate and apprehension, uh, but it's still Europe that all countries want to belong to. And that finally has something to do with, we talk a lot about the, 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 that the permissive consensus has gone. We now have constraining dissensus. Member states don't want to compromise. Actually, our book shows there's an enormous commitment to the EU and member states are willing to compromise. So um, uh, that's a positive note about the narrative. There's a commitment but the narratives are conservative and not easy to change. And that may be difficult for the discussions that we have in the coming um, two, three days here on narratives. How can we change the narratives? Because Bone spoke about Europe needs a bigger flag, but many groups of countries don't want to have the symbol of the flag. Let me leave it here, uh, Hussein, for the discussion. Great, thank you very much, Adrian. Um, so uh, we're delighted to be joined by Barbara Lippert. Um, she's Director of Research in the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. Barbara, I'd like, like you to tell us about the traditional German narrative. What, what, does it, what does it consist in? What story has it told about Europe? What has it asserted? Where have, where have its silence has been? Um, and how has it changed over time? Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Hussein. Um, thank you for having me uh, at this uh, conference. Um, I would say that uh, compared to, uh, to the UK and, and maybe some, some other member states, Germany has never wanted to leave the European Union, but to build uh, the European Union. 
And uh, from the beginnings of uh, the European communities up to German unification and uh, even up uh, today, uh, European integration is perceived in Germany as a success uh, story. Uh, and uh, after the war, of course, you refer to that it was a way for Germany, for the Federal Republic of, of Germany, to regain political respectability among uh, democracies, among other democratic uh, states. And it was the basis for peace and for prosperity. And the lessons uh, Germany has drawn from uh, 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 the war was never, never again and never alone. And I think this is something uh, where you can see these are some factors and dispositions which continue. And at the heart was, of course, German Franco reconciliation and cooperation, which also developed into constructive uh, uh, initiatives for developing, building the European Union. The ideas behind it in the period up to German unification, when Germany was a semi sovereign country, which was ready to share or pool sovereignty, the guiding ideas in Germany, we talk about light builder, were of course federalism, a multi-level system of policy making. It was on the economic side, order liberalism, and all in a way of policy making that was uh, gradualist. So step by step, seeing it as a process, giving it some sort of finality, uh, many thought about United States of Europe uh, or in the Maastricht Treaty, ever closer union. So this was cross-party consensus uh, uh, in Germany. And we've seen that with Kohl, the notion of European Union is about war and peace, basically. This um, uh, was getting weaker and weaker. And in the Schröder-Fischer area, era, we saw that uh, uh, some talked about Germany becoming more British. So which means in your term, more transactional, more looking for the gains uh, and costs of uh, uh, integration. But it was the start of a more realist and pragmatic approach towards uh, uh, Europe. And this has also, to my mind, become the hallmark of the Merkel uh, uh, period, which has now uh, ended. It was, I would say, free of vision, short of, of ideas to do more than uh, limiting the damages and, uh, for example, rescuing the Constitutional Treaty, which came out as the Lisbon Treaty. So there were contributions to it, but more limited, more pragmatic, also more uh, ad hoc. And overall, I would say Germany has always, right from the start, uh, been led by its own national, we didn't express it in these terms, but by national interest. And the interest is to preserve the status quo. Why the status quo of the European Union very much matches basic interests and preferences of Germany. And they lie in the field of defining the rules, shaping the overall framework, not so much very concrete possession goals, but having a framework that fits in very well with German interests. And that is why Germany uh, moves beyond the status quo only when this status quo is at risk, when we see a, 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 a challenge for uh, 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 the rules that have been uh, defined. And so uh, I think uh, Germany in that sense has also uh, been a normal country for a very for a very long time. I don't like the notion of Germany as a hegemon because I think that uh, Germany misses some of uh, the capacities that a hegemon needs. For example, acting uh, 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 unilaterally across the areas. Uh, Germany is by some also seen as a not so normal 
country, as, and I think that also Arjan referred uh, to this uh, uh, perception because uh, of uh, 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 a specific attitude towards power and in particular military uh, power. Germany was happy to outsource uh, uh, this field to NATO, so it did not play a prominent role in the developing of the European Union. So uh, from that point of view, also uh, preserving the status quo, keeping the EU together, which has become some sort of a new narrative over the last years, uh, is, uh, 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 fits into my mind very well uh, with uh, uh, the, the former, with the traditional concept of uh, Germany's uh, EU uh, policy. And so uh, I think that uh, this is also something uh, which will be important for the next German government. There are structural uh, elements which will continue. Germany will continue to be uh, an indispensable member state and power inside uh, the European uh, Union, but maybe it will be in a weaker position with the exit of, of Merkel and the new composition of a three-party, probably, uh, 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 coalition. And uh, I would say that uh, what is most important for, let's say, the future narrative of Germany will be the enormous changes around the European Union, so the external factors uh, that challenge the European Union to go beyond the status quo, uh, they are uh, 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 most important. Uh, and maybe we talk about uh, the future in the next uh, round. I leave it uh, with that as a start. Thank you. Right, thanks very much, Barbara. So you anticipated the, the, the question, which was what will change after, um, after Sunday's results? And it'd be very interesting to see if there is a tripartite uh, tripartite -like coalition and what change that makes. Um, I'm, I'm sort of dying to ask you a question really about um, about what change what changed between um, um, Minister Schaubler's um, you know sort of thought and utterance that you know the Greeks should be allowed to you know, leave the eurozone um, and you know, um, the Germans acceptance Germany's acceptance of the uh, recovery and resilience fund I mean what what um, it, it seems that the principle of mutualization was actually accepted more laterally how would do you see that as a as a as a tension between those two two positions or as a development? Yeah. Well, first one has to to see that uh, Schäuble uh, was not successful with his uh, uh, with his ideas and and uh, proposals, and that is, I think, quite important. Uh, the role that the chancellor plays uh, in in EU uh, policy, and uh, she at the time had uh, uh, the clear priority to keep the European Union uh, together. And that also hints at something which is, to my mind, very important. Germany cannot become, let's say, a player like uh, uh, Britain, and, and of course does not want to become one, uh, because it's not a purely transactional approach. It's not purely uh, led by economic uh, interest. It has a strong political uh, uh, dimension. Uh, and that is why Germany also, given its geography, looks for binding in countries. It is not a country that looks for, let's say, exclusive clubs. And that is, this is maybe more prominent in the thinking of Schäuble, also from the core Europe uh, 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 proposals in the early uh, 90s. Uh, I would say that, that Germany agreed uh, with France uh, uh, to, to make a move for the, what we know for the, the recovery and rescue fund was that uh, 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 it, was a, it was a crisis situation. Uh, and uh, uh, of course the self-interest was to have a functioning uh, internal market to have a robust uh, uh, economy and you can't be part of the internal market and then follow uh, to a large extent only a domestic uh, 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 preferences. So it would not work for Germany. And that was why a step was done. And you know that there were a lot of footnotes. So it should be a one-off thing. Uh, 
uh, we will talk about it and the next government in Germany has to talk about it. With, do we want to continue along uh, these lines? Uh, Scholz spoke about Hamiltonian moment, etc. Whatever it's worth, it signals that there is something uh, uh, at least developing towards maybe also a modification, if not change, uh, of uh, the German positions on fiscal policy. Great. Thanks very much indeed. So turning to you, um, Antonio Villafranca, uh, Director of Studies and co-head of the Central on Europe and Global Governance at ISPI. Um, could you say something about the different phases of the development of the um, Italian narrative? And is the, is the external change idea, the external chain, change idea, is that, is that gone now? Um, and does, does Italy believe that it's Europe that has departed from Italy rather than Italy departing from, from Europe? Thank you very much, Hussein, and thank you. Uh, thanks to Klingendal, of course, for having me today. So you know that Italy has always been quite uh, youth enthusiastic. I mean, uh, traditionally, it has been, uh, you know, the acceptance and the trust uh, in the European Union has been uh, above the EU average. This is, you know, the trend that we, could see, we can see in the second half of the 19th century, but also at the beginning of the new century, up until the, uh, you know, explosion of the financial crisis, which was a a game changer for Europe, for, 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 for Italy. And also I think that the, the narrative and the key concepts through which Italians describe the European Union changed. I mean, the traditional concepts are those of uh, peace, stability, and prosperity, which as Ajahn said before, goes hand in hand with solidarity. With Italians having very clear that Italy for decades has been you know, a net contributor to the EU budget. I mean, also Italy made it's part in a way, okay, we can you know, discuss about it, but I mean, this is you know, the perception that we have. While when the financial crisis exploded, you know, another key, con key buzzword concerning the European Union emerged in, uh, uh, in Italy, which is what we call in Italian vincolo esterno, the external constraint, which has intrinsically a negative, of course, meaning uh, a negative uh, uh, you know, a connotation but also a positive one. I mean, you know, in Italy, we can improve our hold and maybe not very effective policy because the European Union, you know, is asking us to do it. I mean, so there is also a positive connotation, but the negative connotation exploded during the uh, financial crisis in which, you know, uh, the European Commission, the opposite in this case of what, what uh, the perception of it probably is prevailing in the Netherlands was seen as you know a sort of an, a non-elected you know uh, government which was imposing very heavy constraints uh, on uh, countries uh, in which were in troubles basically, including of course uh, including Italy. So just to give you a figure, while the uh, you know the um, the trust of the of Italians in the EU was speaking at uh, sixty percent of Italians uh, in at the beginning of the new century. Uh, it was about twenty percent after the uh, explosion of the of the crisis. So the world it, it basically it planted. I mean, trust in the European planted, and that was also the period in which uh, some parties were talking about Italy exit. To be sure, not an exit uh, from the European Union, but from the euro, from the single currency. And again, to be sure, that was not shared by the majority of Italians. It was just a part of the Northern League and of the Five Star Movements, which were, which was, they were discussing, I mean, this possibility, but they knew very well, I mean, that there was not, you know, that, that the majority of Italians was not supporting the uh, idea, but not exiting from uh, you know the uh, European Union as a whole then we have the third phase in this evolution in which you know the trust in the European uh, Europe uh, in the European Union uh, is uh, already, uh, again on the rise now we say we can say that you know there is half and half you know of Italians supporting being euro enthusiastic if you want or euro skeptical I mean and now it's you know uh, more more balanced uh, to this, um, in this in this regard, and also the uh, political debate has completely changed, especially after the next generation EU, and especially after you know 
the new government with uh, Mario, uh, with, uh, Mario Draghi uh, as a leader. Now the narrative is different also in the Five Star Movement, which is not really you know, Eurosceptical anymore. And also inside the Northern League, the narrative is totally different. There is nobody is talking about you know, leaving the Eurozone uh, anymore. I mean, this is not an issue in Italy uh, at the moment. And uh, of course, there are high expectations on uh, the delivery of the European Union, which is, you know, the key point. I mean, this should, this is in a way, you know, another buzzword uh, in uh, Italian perceptions. I mean, uh, we love or we don't love the European Union to the extent to which the European Union is able to deliver. And we experienced, you know, in the past, especially after the financial crisis, that the European Union was almost at the point of not delivering at all. Then, of course, you know, the situation was managed. And that's why, I mean, you know, the trust in the European Union kept growing again. Uh, but, I mean, this, you know, attitude of Italians towards the European Union is very much linked to the ability of the European Union to deliver, of course, on what the Italians, you know, consider, you know, the most important things on which the European Union should deliver, which is, again, peace, stability and prosperity going hand in hand with Solidarity. So I will stop here and, of course, uh, open to your question. Great. Thank you very much, Antonio. Well, I'm sure we'll, 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 we'll come back to you. Um, so it's a great, it's a great pleasure, it's a great privilege to um, to introduce Anita uh, van den Ender, who's Director General for European Cooperation at the Dutch Ministry for Foreign Affairs. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, it's great to have you with us. Um, we, I just wonder what one of the surprises um, from, from our book, certainly for me, was that um, the, the academic literature has presented um, the Netherlands is a country that has been um, you know, very sympathetic to, to federalism, to a very strongly integrationist perspective. And, and certainly from, from what Adrian has recounted, that's not absolutely right, that, it, that it's more committed to an intergovernmental um, sort of model. Um, and that, that, that there's been a, quite a lot of stability um, with respect to that. I just wondered how you would tell the story of the, um, the Dutch um, European narrative is it pragmatic? Is it ideological? Are there natural allies? Um, and how will it cope, you know, given the, the, the closeness of this relationship with the UK, with Brexit? Is there a, is there a strategy? Okay, thank you so much. Um, as you clearly mentioned, uh, that I'm looking at it from a more, in a way, pragmatic perspective, not from uh, an academic perspective. Uh, it's a thing I'm dealing with every day already for 25 years within the, the Dutch government. Um, and what I've been seeing is that we have been quite consistent, I think, in the way Dutch people or the Dutch government look, looks at the European un Union. Uh, there's still among the people uh, a lot of positiveness regarding the European Union. Uh, people see um, that we need the union uh, to be to have to have a, a something to say in, in the world, um, and I think there's no doubt for a lot of people that we would be uh, we would have less welfare in Europe without the European Union being there. For Dutch people, always the internal market, free trade has always been very important uh, aspects of uh, the membership of the European Union. And I think you mentioned Brexit. I think for a long time, we might have felt quite comfortable in a way in a triangle between France, Germany and Great Britain. We were right in the middle. And I think that's a position in a way we like because we're very pragmatic. When we, when we, when we can make a deal, we make a deal. Uh, and then we have rules and we want everyone to obey to the rules. So... I think if you if you see uh, if you have some buzzwords to towards the way we look at the European Union, I think it's fair, it's strict, and it's merit based. Um, and th this this strictness, uh, it's I think it's often mentioned. That's also why uh, the Netherlands. I think we have a strong history of always being very supportive of the Euro Commission. We see them as the guardian of the European Treaty, not only in economic, uh, on economic issues, but especially also on, on rule of law issues. 
what we have seen lately in Poland, in Hungary, for us, it's very important that we have rules. And sometimes these rules are on economic topics. And then we want the commission to, to, to take care that all countries obey to the rules. But we also have rules which are not from an economic perspective, but values. We, we are in this community together. And that's, I think it's very strongly felt. We're in this together. We have an internal market, but we also share the same values. Uh, when we look at countries, we say, okay, you have to, 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 to also to take care of the values and especially the rule of law and everything related to that. So I think a lot of people have always uh, based the Netherlands is only looking at the economic perspective, but I think this value community has always been very, very important and even more important maybe in the last couple of years because they're under pressure now sometimes. Um, so, so that are some key uh, words. And if we look, um, it was already mentioned, the recovery fund. I think uh, it was in a way a difficult year uh, because there was a lot of uh, maybe mistrust. What was the Netherlands going to do? Um, and I think also there, if you look at it from these keywords, merit-based, strict and fair, we always have seen that, especially Spain and Italy, have been hit hardest by the COVID crisis. We saw that and we wanted to help them. And because we always want to be fair to other countries, uh, although solidarity is maybe not the key word, maybe other words are more important, but we always want to be, be fair and reach out. Uh, but then we said, okay, we are in this together and we think also that the European Union in a way is as strong at the, as the weakest link. So we want all member states to do some kind of upwards convergence. So we said, okay, we see that we have to invest in digital, in green, uh, in a green recovery. But we think that we can only be stronger and be more competitive uh, as a European Union on a world market if we also have these reforms. Uh, and people felt that's very strict. How can you ask for reforms in a COVID crisis? But I think from my perspective, that was the one thing that we in the end could say, okay, then you can have grants, which we now have in the recovery funds, but then we can only have those grants because we have to come out stronger, every country in itself and the whole European Union as a whole, because we need the European Union to be uh, a, a player on the world market uh, because this transatlantic, transatlantic uh, part has always been very important for the Netherlands uh, and with Britain leaving we say we have we feel in a way a keeper of, of some things uh, maybe Britain was always on the front line when it became trade of the transatlantic uh, relationship and we might sometimes feel we're not maybe not have picked a role, but we're now in this role because Britain left. And I think from all countries in Europe, I think the Netherlands was one of the countries feeling maybe uh, the saddest of all that Britain left us, but it's, it's how it is and we have to deal with it now. So I think uh, I will leave it for there for now. Yeah, thanks very much. I think there's a, there's a competition for, for feeling sympathy that, that the UK has gone off, been this one for the UK is. It's gone. But thanks very much, and, you, um, and thank you also for, for um, answering the question I was going to ask about sort of, you know, uh, for being um, the, you know, leader of the frugals with respect to the um, the um, recovery and rescue rescue fund. Can we can we talk about the um, about national narratives and the commission now? Um, I mean, one of the one of the points about national narratives is they provide a kind of dual function. They're they're um, uh, discussions upwards about what you want um, from the EU, about what member states, uh, how they see it as developing, um, what's permissible, what isn't permissible, but they're also downward looking, they're also discussions with citizens, they're trying to persuade citizens um, or to um, convince citizens of, um, of the value of the EU. Um, does the, have you felt that the Commission in, in, in the recent past, and by that I mean the last 20 years actually I suppose, um, do you think that, feel that the, the last few commissions then um, have been difficult to support? Um, have they been too uh, radical, too ambitious in what they've been asking for? Or do you feel that, um, that the ambitions, the aspirations identified by the Commission have been helpful in some way to the development of the national narrative? Um, so, um, Barbara or Antonio or Anita, would you like to um, answer that question? Maybe if I can, if I, if okay. I can start. I mean, uh, 
when it comes to Italy, you know, the opinion on the commission, uh, uh, the man on the street uh, has about the commission is, uh, I have no opinion. Because, you know, we don't have, of course, we know perfectly what the European Commission is, what are the difference between the Commission uh, and the European Parliament and the Council, the European Council and so on. There is anything but clear to people, just to be sure. So, I mean, uh, uh, for people, usually the European Union is a sort of monolith uh, in which, you know, it's not clear who is doing what. So this is a certain point on the Commission. But overall, the, uh, the impression that, you know, the Italian side of the Commission, especially after the financial crisis, was, you know, a negative one because the Commission was, as I said before, the non-elected government, government imposing rules. So the Troika, of course, was, you know, the center of all the critics coming from, uh, from, uh, from Italy with the EU and the Commission uh, in it. But my personal point of view, if I may say, because so far I did say what you know the Italians think is that it's very telling that you know for uh, in in the, in the Netherlands for instance you know the Commission is the voice uh, of the South while in the South it is uh, basically the voice of the North so it means that you know to some extent the European Commission is doing right, quite well uh, in finding you know a balanced approach to such a diverse European Union. Barbara, go. yeah. Um, I think the, the perception of the Commission depends on uh, what the benchmark is. And for many, the benchmark still is the Delors uh, Commission, where we had the, the uh, consolation that uh, uh, Delors was uh, backed by Germany and France and so could initiate major uh, reform processes. And compared to, to this, maybe singular uh, uh, constellation, uh, all successing, uh, succeeding uh, commissions were less prominent uh, in, in the political uh, debate. And I have to say, when I look at uh, the, the election campaign uh, in Germany, uh, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, although being a German uh, at the head of the, the uh, commission, uh, did not play any role, was not no point of reference, uh, um, which might also be because we, we didn't talk about the European Union uh, uh, at all. But I think uh, those who are more, let's say, part of the political class, they uh, see that uh, 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 the important frameworks, and that is, I, I said, that is very, very uh, important for, for Germany's overall approach, defining this framework. This is very much done by uh, uh, the commission, which is due to the, to the legislative uh, 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 processes, which are of course not so um, uh, 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 exciting. And so only the decisions taken uh, in the framework of the, the uh, uh, European Council, they gain some attention, but then the whole follow-up and the preparation uh, uh, before, this is not uh, 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 seen as the work of, uh, uh, of the Commission, but they are rule setters. It's, I think it's, it's, uh, uh, they, they are enormously important and it depends on the political families and, and groupings, whether um, they go for a more political kind of uh, Commission or the neutral one. I am very much in favor uh, in the current situation of a, a commission uh, more on the Dutch side uh, that is able uh, to uh, 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 support keeping the EU together, which means finding compromises and being a neutral, a more neutral uh, uh, kind of institution, which also gains its authority by being a reliable uh, actor. Uh, and I think uh, we need that now in the period of implementation of the next generation EU uh, fund, uh, all the money that is spent uh, in uh, the member states should be directed towards the, the objectives that have to be, that were defined before. And I think uh, a commission that is more neutral is better placed uh, uh, to play this role and to be trusted by most, if not all, 
uh, of the member states. Great, right. thanks very much. Anita, did you have a view? Yes, I think uh, I already mentioned a little bit in my introduction. I think uh, for the Netherlands, um, we have high, high expectations of the Commission uh, to have, in a way, a neutral uh, position, as, as Barbara said, but also in um, in keeping the rules uh, we, we, we made together. The Commission sets rules and we have this Council and the European Parliament, but then there's a rule. And we really, I think that that's really strongly felt. Maybe we are not always agree uh, with all the rules coming from Brussels, but when the rule is a rule in the Netherlands, we obey it and we live to it. And we expect other countries to do the same. And we expect the commission to be the guardian that all the, the all countries implement uh, the rules in the same way that they all um, uh, take this rule seriously. And I think some, there has been some disappointment about the commission that especially around the stability and growth pact, but also with, around this rule of law that the commission is not there as the guardian it should be, but sometimes for sometimes more political reason uh, does not in a way live up to what we expect the commission to do. Uh, and I think we always encourage the commission, okay, we have these rules. It might not have been a Dutch, the Dutch who wanted this in this way, but now they're there you have to make sure that everyone is obeying to them. And I think this is the way we, we see the commission. Um, and I think another thing is sometimes, uh, it was already mentioned, is this a commission from southern countries and northern countries? I think for the Dutch, it's always been very sensitive issue if the commission wants more competence. Because if we see Dutch people, uh, they really like the European Union, but when they, they talk about new competences going to the EU, then it's a different story. And then we see... The, the Dutch people react differently. So I think the commission should be uh, where they are supposed to be, to be this guardian. Great, thanks very much. So because we're, we're, we're at Klingendal, um, because we're, we're, um, we, we need to think about um, sort of the you know, Dutch um, European policy, I wondered um, how, um, how the, if I could ask how the Netherlands is perceived um, in, um, in other member states, so in German and Italy, I've got to put you on the spot, I'm afraid. Um, so do you know what the Netherlands wants? Do you know what the Netherlands stands for? Is it very clear in articulating its position on um, core issues in general, on, on specific matters that, that, that concern itself? Um, what, do you, what do you think? Don't feel under any pressure, this might, this might be one of the benefits of being online rather than in person. Uh, So, Antonio? Okay, yeah. yeah. So, well, it's quite easy. I mean, uh, let me tell you a joke, which is a sort of diplomatic tradition, but again, it's a joke. You know, uh, when, you know, an Italian diplomat doesn't know what to vote for at the European Union, well, uh, usually he sticks to the French position. But if he doesn't know the French position in advance, he simply votes against the Dutch position, <laughs> which is, of course, a joke. But, you know, it's very telling because, you know, I mean, in Italy, uh, we know that, you know, there are differences in the European Union. The most different country is the Netherlands uh, in terms of perception, in terms of preferences uh, and so on. It doesn't mean that, you know, differences uh, cannot be met and they have been met. I very much appreciated what Anita said because I totally agree when it comes to the uh, uh, next generation EU that, you know, Money goes hand in hand with reforms. There is no way to spend well money if we don't change our economic prospects and we change our economic potential only if we make reforms. And we need a European Commission controlling not only that money is spent well, but also that the reforms are really implemented. I mean, there is really a possibility to, you know, have this. Um, let's say denying you know, exchange between the different positions uh, with Italy and the Netherlands in this joke be, being at the opposite. I mean, there is a good compromise which is beneficial both to the Netherlands and to Italy. Bob, Barbara, over to you. From a, maybe from a, from a German uh, point of view, uh, the Netherlands are quite close 
to to German positions, but uh, maybe the 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 style is 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 uh, different of, of policy making, and of course Germany sees uh, the Netherlands as after Brexit in particular the leader of the Hanseatic League. Uh, they are those who uh, are quite outspoken on on issues mainly restricted to the to the economic uh, field less uh, uh, vocal on other uh, issues a, as a group and of course germany uh, does not uh, is not is not part of of these uh, groupings but i think monitors it it uh, uh, closely and uh, uh, as france is portrayed as the opposite of the uh, leader of the opposite camp uh, of the Hanseatic League, Germany is, uh, feels quite comfortable in the middle. And that is the typical German uh, uh, position th then. So also on, on values, for example, uh, it was reported that uh, um, uh, uh, the Dutch uh, uh, Prime Minister Rutte uh, talked about why don't you leave to, to, to Hungary or Poland, the European Union, a German Chancellor could think about it, but would never say it uh, 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 openly. Uh, and uh, that is again, uh, uh, because uh, uh, Germany's role and, and, and place in the European Union is very different. But I would say that uh, um, the next German government would be very well advised to invest more also in, in bilateral uh, cooperation with uh, uh, the Netherlands. I think that uh, these have been neglected uh, over the last uh, uh, years. And I think uh, as it was the case with the UK, we have a lot in common uh, 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 when you look at, 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 at several uh, um, uh, policy fields, trade, uh, for example, as one of the, the, the major uh, uh, fields. So um, it's a it's a it's a mixed picture. Anissa, can I ask? Did, did you expect those responses? Yes, a little bit. As I think, I think it's more um, it's more subtle in a way because um, uh, I'm also responsible for all the bilateral relationships and. Actually, uh, I have great counterparts in, 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 in Germany and Italy. And I think it's not like that we, that there are no topics. Uh, we always is, uh, are against Italy. It's, it's not like that. Uh, and also with France, uh, now we have this big climate package. It's fit for 55. Um, I think we have been always on an issue at, as climate. We have been working very well together, also with France, but also with other countries. Uh, so it, it's not always uh, black and white. And also, I think uh, when it comes to rule of law and things like that, I think we share the same values as people do in Italy and in Germany. As, and so it may, mostly some discussion is focused uh, on the uh, economic side. But even there, I think, uh, and I, I just heard it mentioned that, that we don't agree so much as it sometimes looks in the press because i said we felt that italy or we saw that italy was really really hit hard by COVID. Uh, and in the end as i said we wanted to help but on the right conditions because we really want to be italy to be to be stronger also in the economical side um but sometimes then you have some misperceptions or it's it's well, dutch people can be blunt or direct and then it's it's sometimes you have uh difference more difference sometimes in the press than we have in in reality um and i think yes uh some sometimes we have a position like with the focus but we try always to reach out to work together uh, and i think the bilateral relationship in general uh, are quite are quite good and as was mentioned before uh prime minister rutter has a, had a very good relationship with 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 angela merkel but also with mr draghi also with mr macron so i think we we, we work together but sometimes we we disagree but uh, i think when you're a strong community you can also sometimes disagree but also find a way forward and I think we managed also we managed in the end to do that with recovery fund so and now 
yeah, I think that's the good thing. And I, I, I think everyone wants now that it's really going to work out well uh, for Italy. And I think that it's for Italy, it feels itself, it has a chance now to, to do something, to, to change, to have a better economic perspective. So I think they're working hard on it. So, uh, so I'm not surprised, but I'm always hopeful and optimistic uh, because I think we need each other and we always have to find ways to... Uh, to solve problems we've had and to look forward because we have this migration issues, climate issues. There are so many more issues than only the economic issues within the EU. And uh, I think on a lot of those issues we work very well together with, with all countries, also with Italy and Germany. Great, thanks very much. Um, so, Walter, I understand we've got a question. Can we, can we, can we come over to you for... Uh... Yes, of course. Um... Thank you, Sain, and I'd like to encourage everyone who's in the audience to also submit your questions uh, via the Q&A function. Uh, uh, we had one question coming in from Ramsey Tufik on the AUKUS case, uh, the fact that France regarded the agreement between Australia, the UK and the US uh, mostly as a political issue rather than a, a sort of con commercial breach of contractual obligations. Well, going back to the whole narratives discussion, uh, the question is whether this says something also about the French EU narrative and maybe uh, whether other member state reactions uh, to this issue say something about uh, their EU uh, narrative. So that's one question that we had from the audience. Uh, maybe one of the uh, uh, panelists would like to say something about that. Uh, maybe uh, uh, I could use this opportunity also to pose a question myself to uh, Mr. Villafranca. Um, who talked about the ability of the EU to deliver uh, and that this actually constitutes a major factor in the Italian uh, narrative or perception of the EU. Um, Ms. van der Ende just mentioned that there are, of course, uh, other um, fields than just the economic one that play a role, also migration, for example. And I would just like to ask Mr. Villafranca what impact EU migration and as asylum policies have on the Italian narratives in the EU? Uh, especially since you mentioned that the trust in the EU in Italy is again on the rise, even though I would say at least uh, uh, we have not yet seen a fully effective EU migration policy in the past uh, uh, number of years. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going, I'm going to give my position and, and also ask a question, which is um, um, Jose Manuel Barroso gets a lot of criticism for his um, attempt to, to, to create and cultivate a, a narrative. And, and it sort of leads me to the reflection, you know, who ought to speak for Europe, who ought to be narrative making on the part of Europe? Do, do member states do enough in terms of um, owning Europe, um, of explaining Europe, of justifying Europe to their own, to their populations? And to link it to the first question we heard about with, with submarines, should we not have expected a sort of chorus of solidarity from our national capitals about um, the loss of that um, contract? Is this another element of, of narrative making that, that currently just isn't there, the infrastructure doesn't exist or the understanding that sort of culture doesn't exist? So feel free to sort of pick and choose which which you answer. Um, I'll be embarrassed if you answer my question. Not other people's. Maybe if I can very briefly uh, say it to the the way Italian leaders have been describing the European Union so far. Uh, well, usually the European Union is the perfect scapegoat to Italian failures. Frankly speaking, I mean we were not able to implement a policy to make a reform. Uh, well, then we must do it because of the, 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 the external constraint. So it is the perfect scapegoat for uh, uh, Italian leaders. Uh, on the ability to deliver on uh, migration, I mean, let's stick to the fact there is no advancement uh, at the European level on migration. Yes, a little more money has been given uh, in the European budget on migration, but when it comes to relocation, to the way to really, you know, face together the challenge of migration. I mean, there is no advancement uh, since, you know, 2015, since, you know, the very high, the peak of the uh, of migration. So unfortunately, if another migration flow will, uh, uh, will emerge, another dramatic flows to Italy, I mean, again, the narrative uh, of Italians will be negative, will turn negative because in fact, the ability to deliver, there is no advancement. I'm not saying whether it is good or not. I'm just saying there is no advancement, whether we like it or not. And on the, the question on uh, the Australia deal, uh, the Australian deal, 
Well, I think we, again, we have to get out of the usual division be between Euro skepticism and Euro enthusiasm and trying to be Euro pragmatic. Also, when it comes, especially when it comes to foreign security policies uh, and with the idea of uh, strategic autonomy, which, frankly speaking, is quite an empty concept. I mean, do you want to be real when it comes to security and foreign policy? Okay, what we need in concrete terms, maybe this is my economic background, which is speaking now. But I mean, we need some things. Are we serious about it with we have unanimity? No, we are not. Then. Are we serious about it we don't speak at the proper international context with a single voice, which means in concrete terms, is France willing to share with the European Union its seat at the Security Council of the United Nations, yes or not? And third, when it comes to weapons, the only nuclear weapon, nuclear power in Europe after Brexit is France. Is again France willing to share its nuclear weapons with the other member states? These are governance and credibility on foreign security policy. This would give concrete content to strategic autonomy in foreign security policy. So Anita or, or Barbara, would you like to in the mix? Yes, I would, I would uh, basically agree with what Antonio uh, said and, and also as far as perception uh, was concerned on the, the uh, Australian deal and the, the formation of this triangular uh, uh, alliance. I think in, in, uh, in Germany, the, at least the government was, was happy that we were in the midst of the, the election campaign and uh, were silent more or less on the, on the issue and need not take sides because of course there was some uh, uh, support for the, 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 uh, the French uh, uh, position, although it was also seen as a bit exaggerated as far as the rhetoric uh, was concerned. But uh, I think Germany would be very interested in, in, uh, in turning this, uh, in a way, disaster for, for France into a chance to, uh, uh, to give, again, impetus to what is called the, the uh, a strategic autonomy or European sovereignty. I think uh, uh, this is uh, something which uh, which the EU will have to address and basically uh, France, uh, but also Germany, because Germany, of course, has uh, traditionally uh, uh, a preference for uh, the, the transatlantic uh, uh, relations and would really have to go beyond what I define as the status quo. So uh, uh, I think that in this field of, of defense policy, uh, uh, cooperation, having uh, some sort of, of also supranational uh, component uh, uh, in, in um, defense and security policy, uh, these are uh, uh, questions the new government has to answer if it wants to move forward. And the signs to my mind are that uh, uh, these challenges are taken more seriously because they're more urgent. Uh, and uh, uh, when you look at, at uh, let's say the, the three parties which, which uh, possibly form the next government, I think they, they have very, they have some divergencies, different positions on, on these issues. But I think they will have a more open debate in Germany. And we need to have this debate because it's not only a problem of the political class and actors, policymakers, but also as far as the attitudes of uh, uh, the German citizens are uh, concerned, uh, uh, which were quite, quite happy uh, uh, that, uh, uh, they, that Germany always played a very small role role uh, uh, in these uh, questions and I think uh, uh, that will that will need to my mind that we need uh, to change and I'm not so pessimistic uh, as Antonio is I think there is there is now maybe a new drive to really take up uh, uh, these issues great thanks very much Anita do you, do you want to 
Comment. Yes, I think I think it's it's difficult, but because this is a very uh, it issue, this came up uh, only uh, last week in a way, uh, and I think as you what I already said about uh, the Dutch also uh, in a way being the keeper of this the importance of the transatlantic relationship, uh, it, it's it's a very difficult case in a way. Of course, we feel for France. Uh, we work together with France on a on a on a lot of issues. Uh, but we also uh, see how important the relationship with the United States is uh, also on, on economical issues, uh, on digitalization and things like that. Um, so I think what we try to, we hope that we, that we in a way find a problem, uh, find a way, uh, find a way out. And I think that there was some common statement uh, uh, from France and the United States that, that really helps. Uh, because I think in the Netherlands we need both. We we feel with France, but we also see that we uh, need the United States uh, working together. And I think that's 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 this whole concept of strategic autonomy. I uh, heard uh, a lot of people say, "What what do you mean by it?" And I think uh, that a lot of countries uh, they they know the concept, but they don't feel the same thing. And uh, in the Netherlands, we when we talk about strategic autonomy, we all, always like to say no strategic autonomy but open strategic autonomy and i think that uh, of course we see especially with the health crisis with covid we have had uh, that we should look at things we should arrange better within the eu uh, to tackle vulnerabilities in supply chains and things like that we we on the same line on that but then there's always the then but that we can work on those things. But for us, it will always be very important to have this openness, to have to stay true to principles of cooperation, international cooperation, openness. It's always has everything to do with it, with uh, the mention I'm already mentioned about the trade. We always uh, have uh, high values on. So I think we have this uh, concept, but I think the way we look at it if, uh, as an analysis is a little bit different from the perspective some other countries within the EU look from, uh, from the perspective of strategic autonomy. Great, thanks very much. Because um, we're running out of time a bit, um, Adrian, can I invite you to talk a bit about, uh, well, to, to summarise what Andrew Crowell would have said or what his, what his points were? Yes, thank you, Hussein. Um, maybe, uh, um, <clears throat> before I'm going to summarize the, the points of the columnists that we had invited and stuck in, in, in Athens, which is a very great place to be stuck, I guess. Um, <clears throat> just a couple of things, maybe as a reflection. Uh, I, I see a lot of as being discussed also on the external dimension. And I have to say that the entire afternoon of the State of the Union conference is, 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 is aimed at discussing further the position of the EU in the world and the narratives that we need for that. And we, we start at, at 1.30 with a conversation between Monica C, the director of Klingenau and <clears throat> the director of the uh, China Institute um, uh, from China, uh, Jiang Weiwei, on the, the Chinese uh, uh, narrative in the world, and uh, uh, so we'll come back to the to the to the external dimension of, of the narratives. Um, but th th this is, of course, how do we sell Europe at home? What 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 do ministers do? What what should the the, the Commission do in that respect? And I take you know, my message here. Two points is I think the word pragmatism has been used most. Uh, I haven't counted it, but I think that's the word that comes out uh, from, from, from your, uh, Antonio said it, Anita said it, Barbara said it. Uh, so I think Barbara, pragmatism is, is the key word here. Not visionary, by the way. Um, uh, and concerns about the position of the European Commission as a political actor in a rule-based society. Um, okay, now, Andres uh, uh, Crowell, his comments. Um, I think his his comments are really necessary because what he did for Klingenau uh, is the Klingenau has a, a foreign policy opinion barometer, 
and uh, Monica C already said in her opening of the conference that you know, it's important as think tank to be fact based. So that's why we have this foreign policy barometer. What do people think in the EU? And we this the project of uh, Andre Krau was specifically about Dutch attitudes towards the EU, the Dutch, the critical EU country. That's our reputation. The first point he makes is that actually Merkel, her leaving the scene now is, is a, a symbolic turning point in the EU uh, because Ber Merkel has been this sort of pragmatic backbone of the EU. Here we have the word pragmatic again. Uh, she was conservative, small steps, no grand visions. Um, uh, uh, she had a very pro-European starting position, also from her own uh, Cold War position and German position, uh, but conservative small steps. And that may be also the end of that period now she's leaving, because maybe the EU needs more. Their expectations, as we also saw by Minister Bone this morning, this is the Europe's global role. That's what we want to be discussing. How do the Netherlands look at this visionary approach to the EU. Now, Andre Krauel identifies six groups in the Netherlands. The most outspoken group is the, are the, the Brexiteers, the next the, the Nexiteers. Um, um, they're outspoken, they're eloquent, uh, they're visible, uh, the media likes to refer to them. Uh, if foreign correspondents ask me about the Dutch position, they always talk about Geert Wilders and Thierry Boudet, but only that is about 10% of the Dutch society, and even Geert Wilders and Thierry Boudet are more outspoken spoken and anti-European as his voters, their voters. So that's the first group. It's a small group. Then the other groups are basically pro-European, but you know, with different emphasis. Um, but basically, there's not much love for the EU. There's not much enthusiasm, but it's pro-European ne nevertheless. The second group he uh, sees is the, the, the hold on Europe group. Uh, it's fine as it is, even the RAF, the budget, you know, temporarily it's fine. We needed to show solidarity. Uh, this is Europe, this is it, this is fine. The third group he has is the trade Europe. Is It's the market. It's no transfer union, it's limitations, it's the market, you know, pro-European, but less. Uh, the, 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 the fourth group is the left pro-Europeans. It's the EU of the people, it's solidarity. It does include transfer, but it's a social Europe. The fifth group he identified is what we call in the Netherlands the D66 group, the pro-European liberals. Uh, the EU is good, uh, we need the market, we need, but a market needs a social Europe and needs a soul. Uh, we need a transfer union. We need to protect our way of living. We need the European values. And the EU needs to be the global power. So on the whole, it is a pro-European uh, country, uh, but reserved. Uh, it's on this uh, no-nonsense type of Europe, mostly. Uh, that would be the sort of Dutch attitude. That's how we stand in life, basically. We try to be no nonsense, straightforward, uh, not very visionary. And there we may see a clash between the narrative, or the perception of the people, and maybe the challenges of the EU. And that raises a question, how do we move forward if this is a case study of a country with a sort of reserved European attitude? Can you mold the narratives? Can you do something about that to bring the people further along? Or should you start with, this is the people's perception, should that be the starting point of our politics? That's the sort of question at least, at least that I get from uh, his uh, 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 column. And it's very insightful of the Dutch narrative and you can find his background material on the Klingenau website. Hussein, back to you. Well, thank you so much. We're, we're going to finish on time, which is fantastic. Now I might be invited back again as, as we've as we managed to do that. But thank you, panellists, for your, um, your, 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 your very sharp insights, for sharing um, your knowledge and experience with us. We greatly appreciate it. We've learned a lot about the, the, the Dutch, the Italian, the German narrative um, this morning, um, this afternoon even. 
Um, and, um, and you know, um, I'd like to um, just underline um, Adrian's reminder, um, half past one Central, um, Central European time, you can join um, the next panel, which will be a conversation between um, Zhang Weiwei and Monica C. So look forward to seeing you then, and we'll address Maxine David's question about the external perception of the EU um, thereby. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.